we are live now sir yeah hi guys so uh, this is the last of i think it's the last of all our talks on uh, the fellowship in lumbar spine and we are trying to uh, now wrap up things by talking about spinal instability and then taking you through some case examples to uh, discuss the mri of the spine uh, it's a little longish program so we are starting on time even as people join we can go back and forth and not worry about um, you know about people missing anything because it's kind of in a loop also um, i'll encourage everyone i'm going to say that again when more people join i'll encourage people to butt in and ask questions because otherwise things get left behind so whatever you can think of just talk me i'll take mul multiple pauses and we can uh, discuss uh, q, q uh, the questions that hit your mind including some that have been put on the chat box so today we're talking of spinal instability to begin with the uh, spinal instability um, to to understand that first we need to understand this uh, you know three part complex that was uh, described by farfan and uh, this is a illustration by my mentor dr bhojraj and that simplifies what spinal instability is like so if you look at um uh, if you look at this first diagram on the left it's a normal spine where there's a disc that takes about 70% of the load when you vertically load the back and the facet joints between them take 30% so 50% each the disc is uh, of course stable in flexion and on loading vertical axial loading uh, it is not so stable in twisting while um, the facet joints stabilize the twisting and the extension so uh, with that as we use our backs the disc starts to lose its tenacity the this starts to lose its shape memory and um, um this causes that segment to become unstable and uh, so you, you should have you should think about it like this this is like a tripod like a stool with three three uh, legs if one leg becomes unstable the other two start getting wobbly so typically the culprit is the disc because the disc is 70% of loading so if the disc loses its vertical loading ability the joints behind start to wobble and this is the uh, traditionally known as the phase of instability when the back is not able to take loads under pressure and this can be a whole spectrum because it could just present as recurring back pains it could be just a you know background dull back pain it could be locked backs where the disc keeps getting injured recurrently it could be facetal pains so a person who you know get gets pain on one side of the lower back and the pain traveling down to the buttock etc and um, uh, this this phase is a phase that goes on through adult life and the beginning or the end of the phase is ill defined so there are a lot of people who go through this phase for two decades and they are the ones who keep struggling with back pain and they present to you in opd you have to uh, interpret that as a clinician as a stage of instability or you should call it you know in your head at least as instability back pain now this naturally progresses towards a situation where the disc starts to dry up and as the disc dries up there is auto stabilization in the front so you should think about a weak foam and a foam that's now completely crushed so that's your image number 3 on the screen where the uh, foam completely dries up and there's it's almost like a bone sitting on on the bone and um, this is auto stabilization so now there's no further movement in the main load bearing tripod or leg of the tripod and hence the facet joints behind typically don't get the freedom to move now this as you can see is at the cost of the neural structures because unlike the knee or the ankle the spine harnesses the nerve and uh, as this entire uh, you know system as we say collapses and auto stabilizes crunches down the nerves get compressed and these folks come with claudication and uh, you know neural symptoms now having said that what we are actually talking about so that's the path of lumbar canal stenosis or lcs but there is a variation that can happen and this is again something that you have to think about as a spinal surgeon you need not so every time you see a patient in a different clinical setting you have to interpret that pathology in your head and then you are able to dole out the absolutely correct uh, plan of treatment so some people this phase of instability never stops and they just remain in this phase of instability which eventually becomes chronic and here the disc is not shrinking the disc is tall but the disc is devoid of uh, material or of you know of substance so the disc is like a dilla loose disc in the front and the facet joints start getting more and wo more wobbly the example we give this uh, give here is that of a door hinge when you have a door hinge and you undo a few screws and you keep using the door the entire hinge gets wobbly that's the kind of thing that happens so if someone's phase of instability remains for much longer 
they come to us with a, an advanced instability because of facet loosening. And for those of you who regularly see knee arthritis, you would see the same. There are some knee joints that uh, you know get stiff and painful, and there are others that get wobbly. So similarly here, there is um, the facet joints then take over and they start getting loose. They you know they develop facet effusion and uh, multiple things. And these are the patients that come to you with a combination of spinal instability and neural compression because this instability has uh, taken a path that's quite different and it's progressed to a translational instability which is causing the nerve inside to get pinched on loading. So this is a very, very special condition. Uh, any questions so far? If, if there are any questions, uh, ask them, don't type them because I don't have the ability to see, uh, you know, chat while I'm talking. So um, that is spinal instability. It's the inability of the spine to bear loads without damaging normal structures. Typically neural structures is what we are talking about because the disc and the joint continuously gets damaged the facet capsule also turns out loose. Okay. Now the next key question, and that's a question you want to ask yourself, is um, is degenerative listesis always a unstable situation? So to begin with, you must understand that degenerative listesis is loosening of the facet joint due to advanced facetal arthritis, which leads to a spondylolisthesis. It's got nothing to do with the pars. It's got nothing to do with uh, dysplasia. It is pure arthritis which has gone loose. Okay, so that has to be set in stone in your mind. You should never confuse degenerative listhesis with lytic or with, um, you know, with uh, dysplastic spondylolisthesis. So if you think about it, there are some people who have been through this process where the loosening happened and then have auto-stabilized, right? So there are, there are people who go through instability and auto-stabilization. Some go through instability, severe unstable uh, situations. Listies and then auto stabilize. So those are the people who are, uh, you know, who don't need any stability. So these are the folks who present with pure claudication and um, they don't need stabilization. They can uh, just, I mean, if they, if you, uh, you know, uh, put them up for surgery for lumbar canal stenosis, you can safely decompress them and you don't have to necessarily stabilize them. And this is something as a surgeon you, you should be aware of because, uh, uh, as you know, the uh, you know, the key question that we ask ourselves, because most of these folks are senior elderly people and you want to ask yourself, am I uh, needing to stabilize this guy or not? So there are symptoms of clinical instability and these symptoms are significant back pain. So someone who comes with claudication, but significant back pain, significant restriction in movements, uh, bilateral claudication, and of course, a significantly uh, listes the MR uh, X-ray, which progresses on flexion extension. Mind you, MRI is not the diagnostic modality. And uh, in fact, a standing X-ray and a bending X-ray is what you need to do. And if you see that, then those become clinical signs. So for example, here, you can clearly see in the image that the disc may have gone through that whole process that I described, loosening, but eventually it is imploded and it's a bone-on-bone -bone scenario. So even though it's almost uh, hedging on a grade two spondy, it is still not, um, uh, you know, not uh, an unstable situation. And you can, if you have to operate her, you could just decompress her and get away. Uh, this question comes into play when you're treating a very, very old person for claudication and uh, you want to ask yourself. Sometimes it's a young, healthy spine and you say, I may just add a fixation, which is reasonable. But in these tight spots, you may want to uh, give the patient an opportunity to do decompression alone. And these are all images from, uh, as you can see, from uh, quite old times. 2001 this one and we have long-term follow-ups of these guys as long as there are no red flags for instability you're okay to decompress alone in a situation of a degenerative spondylolisthesis remember degenerative spondylolisthesis almost never goes to grade two and it's almost always at l45 i think if you follow these rules uh, you should be good any quick questions on this just unmute and ask if you have any questions so far because then we are moving to the red flags for degenerative list. So how do you then decide which degen spondy actually needs fixation? Okay. So I'm trying to say that it may be a cut and dry case where you have a bone on bone, 83 year old lady. Sir? Yes. Virendra. Uh, uh, sir. Which are the different symptoms and signs which are present in degenerative and traumatic uh, spondylolysis and listhesis? Yeah, so traumatic spondylolisthesis is, is not a degenerative condition. It follows a significant trauma. It's a very, very rare condition. And it uh, falls into the type C fracture that we discussed the last time. 
So traumatic spondylolisthesis invariably comes with an acute history and often neurology. And uh, it al almost always needs fixation because it's a three column injury. So you cannot actually speak of the of these two in the same breath. A degenerative spondylolisthesis, which comes with significant back pain, localized tenderness, extension catch. Extension catch means a person starts to bend. He or she bends easily. But the minute she starts to straighten, the back locks into extension because the facet actually subluxes. And so she bends like this. And while extending, she locks and then straightens and extends her back. So that is a, a cl classic sign of, um, you know, of, a, of an extension catch. It is not a pain that you get on extension. Uh, of course, a local pain and people who have significant back pain as much as they have a bilateral claudication. So, and of course, then on x-ray, you do get angular and translational instability and there is a significant spondy. Okay, so my next few slides may answer your question even, even more. So when you look at a spondy which uh, has... Uh, grade one, which has a bit of everything, uh, you would want to then look at covert signs of instability. So this is a situation where you are 50-50 in your clinical judgment. Should I fix her or should I just decompress her? Look for these signs. So what do you see here? Anyone? You see significant fluid in the facets. Can you see that? This white. Yes, so a facet joint is like a burger. It has two pieces of bread. The bread belongs to the two Articular processes. The one that's on the outside is the one of the lower bone. The one that's inside is the one of the upper bone. Uh, in between the cheese that you see is the facetal fluid. And normally up to 3 mm of fluid is acceptable, as you can see on this figure here. But if that fluid is increased, uh, it's a sign of instability. Now, what happens is that on an MRI scan, it's done uh, because it's done lying down, you will not actually see a spondylolisthesis. So you have to make a regular uh, effort to look at the actual section and look at how the facet joints look for every case that you're going to operate. And if you have this, it's a sign of instability. So here's one of our cases. It was a pathologist who came with severe back pain and claudication, but his MRI was normal. You would agree that there's not enough compression here to explain his uh, compression. But the minute he stands up and bends forward, you can see there's a spondy. This is the same person. And imagine if on the basis of this, you either conserved him or just did a laminectomy, you would be walking into a trap. And what did we miss? we missed actually seeing his actual image. On the actual image, you can see that there's a lot of fluid. So you have to correlate these three images in your head. And today we make a dictum that any person with an MRI who's headed for a surgery or who has neurological symptoms or signs, uh, you look at the actual image and there's some more details that I'd like you to look at and get a standing bending x-ray before you make any judgment. All right. So th these guys, they would need a T-lift. Someone asked, um, in which case would you do an interbody, in which case would you go with a PLF? That rule remains simple. If you're treating a present instability, which means that the back is unstable on your pre-op clinical workup, you should always put an interbody fusion, assuming it's a young, healthy back, which is a high demand back. Uh, if And there's a tall, tall enough disc space that you're going to disrupt. If there's a thinner disc space, if there is no present instability, but in your head, you're thinking that by... Uh, doing a laminectomy, you may create an instability. You may want, you can get away with a PLF alone. And you'll see some cases as we go and we could discuss that in more depth. Now, here's another person with, um, this is his x-ray and this is his MRI scan. Once again, significant claudication. The minute you see the actual image, the red arrows are pointing out to significant facet fluid. Make this a habit so you will make less and less mistakes. The minute he bends down, you will see that uh, the L45 disc is uh, allowing the bone to slide forward. And that's a degenerative spondylolisthesis. This guy deserves a fusion and um, not um, decompression alone. The question that you may ask is, will you fuse L45 alone or would you take your fusion down to S1? So uh, because the L5 S1 disc is auto stabilized, you can see anterior bone formation, zero movement. There's no disc left at all. You can do what is called a floating fusion here and get away. There's literature to support that just because if you're going to L5, it doesn't mean you need to go to S1 if the L5 S1 segment is stable. So in this case, my choice would be a one level T lift. And of course, I could decompress more than that. So any uh, facet joint which has more than 3 mm of fluid would be considered a wet facet and it is a sign of instability. Any questions? Now look at this gentleman. He comes with a history of claudication with a short history of acute leg pain. Anyone? What is this? So just like a knee joint, please uh, unmute and talk so I know everyone's awake and alive. 
So uh, just like a knee joint, which gets arthritic, can get an effusion and then pop into a popliteal cyst or a Moran Baker cyst. This is a facetal cyst. Okay, so the fluid that you saw in the previous slide, in the previous image, that this fluid can eventually herniate from the capsule and then it can act like a acute disc prolapse because this is now chemical neuritis. It's behave doing the same thing to the nerve that an acute disc does. More than compression, it's causing chemical neuritis. So these folks present with a sudden onset of radiculopathy on the back of a long-standing claudication. And their presentation is that. And you see this funny white ball there, which is very, very encysted. And uh, this is a facet cyst. This is how it looks. It can, if anything, be uh, uh, confused with an uh, with an arachnoid cyst of the root, nerve root, and sometimes with a disc fragment. It's um, something that your eye should pick up. Almost in all cases, the facet cyst has a backing of the tail of the comet, as we say, which is the white line of the fluid in the joint. It's unlikely that the facet that has no fluid will cause us pop down into a cyst. Is that okay? Any questions? Uh, sir? Yes, Shashan. Uh, sir, as you said that uh, most of uh, regarding the comment on uh, diagnosing a um, facetal cyst, so the axial cut is the primary uh, view we should be looking at into, right, sir? Yes. Because the sagittal... even, the, even the sagittal cut, can you see the one with the red arrow? I don't know if you can see my Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but the, the thing is like the more uh, prominent comet uh, appearance yeah. is more visible on the axial itself, right? I would say that, but yeah. it's both actually. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. My, I think the point I'm trying to drive home here is that you should not confuse this for an arachnoid cyst of the nerve root or a disc fragment. Because when you go in, you got to anticipate this cyst. Because for those of you who have operated these patients, this cyst is looks quite freaky. It's stuck to the nerve root. It is like a huge ball that's pressing on the nerve root and you could really literally peel it off from the nerve root. So it can get very unnerving when you go inside to see this and you feel that you're not going to be able to take it off. Okay, today people who ha don't have a stenosis, like this person here, who doesn't really have a neural stenosis, as you can make out, the canal is quite wide. And as so he or she would not have a long-standing claudication. He would mainly come with a short history of radiculopathy. Our first choice of treatment is CT-guided root uh, cyst structure. And there are very few radiologists who do it. We have someone in Bombay who does it. So today, most of earlier, all these would go for surgery. Today, all of them have at least one or sometimes two attempts at needle aspiration or needle bursting of the cyst. They sometimes do it translaminar, means interlaminar. Sometimes they do it through the joint. Sometimes they burst it. Sometimes they overload it with fluid and burst it. But uh, we have pictures of what they do is they put a dye in the cyst. And then they, you know, pressurize it and you can see the dye overflowing and the patients get instantaneous relief. But um, I would say that uh, six out of 10 times, it's possible six or seven times. And then other times it's not possible because it's technically a bit demanding, as you can imagine. All right. So uh, if anyone is interested, I could send you some pictures of these cyst, uh, CT guided facet cyst structures, which... Uh, at least one of our radiologists is doing. If you yes, need, yes. So this is different from a nerve root block. Giving a nerve root block in a facet cyst is a waste of time because unlike a disc which is going to settle down, the cyst is not going to settle down. So when you give a nerve root block in an acute disc prolapse, you're doing it to buy time until the disc regresses. Here that's not going to happen or it's very, very unlikely to happen. So here giving a root block is really a waste. If you need to do something with a needle, you've got to rupture the cyst and that's an extremely demanding procedure. But like I said, in the last five years, uh, we have done like more than, you know, four or five dozen such. I've not done them, but a uh, radiologist does it. Anything? Okay. So, spot the similarity. We, we right now discussed four cases. Anyone can see something that's different or which is similar to all these four cases that we uh, discussed so far. So all of them have a tall disc on the top of a sacralized L5. So all of them have a lower segment, which is fixed or fused either by degeneration or by nature. And the disc is tall. So this itself becomes a covert sign of instability. So someone who has a auto stabilized L5 S1 and a tall L4 5, you should think of this person as unstable unless proved otherwise. So a tall disc, with 
uh, you know, lower disk that's stable it is going to have overloaded and that disk would have, the facet would have ruptured, uh, would have uh, got unstable significantly. And the minute you put them to a standing bending X-ray, you'll see instability. So train your mind's eye to look for tall disks when you're talking of lumbar canal stenosis surgery. We're not talking of normal adults who are walking around. But when you're talking of operating this person here, you have to think of instability and do the dynamic X-ray. To uh, you know save the guesswork, you could just do a dynamic X-ray for all patients. But sometimes your dynamic X-ray because of pain may not even demonstrate the instability. So these covert signs should all add up in your head. This is not a science, it's an art. So you have to weigh the signs in your head, but all of them should be visible to you when, you, when you're putting your mind to deciding what operation you're going to do. I hope that's clear. This is not a point system where you would, uh, you know, decide that this gets one point and these plus this would get four points. It's not uh, as simple as that, but you need to be aware of all these covert signs. So we talked about facetal effusion. We talked about a facet cyst, and then we talked about um, a, a tall disc on top of a sacralized L5. Uh, the next scenario, which is a scenario of covert instability is a disc herniation in the presence of a lumbar stenosis. So now look at this MRI at the left bottom, the axial section. You would agree that this is the case of lumbar stenosis. You can see significantly hypertrophied capsule here. And you should make your, uh, again, uh, hopefully at the end, we'll have a talk on the MRI reading. So on the MRI reading, when you look at the axial section, if you look at this section, the one that's um, on the right, which is the central image in the three images you see on the screen, you can see that the capsule, this is the, uh, what my arrow is pointing out is a combination of the capsule. And uh, so this is the capsule as well as the yellow ligament. Okay. Uh, it's a combination of that and it's calcified. Th this part is calcified, right? So, um, hang on, I'm trying to take this away. Uh, take away annotation. Oh, does anyone know how to do it? Okay. It's going to now remain on the screen for a long time. Ah. Oh, I knew how to do it. Okay, doesn't matter. So um, uh, when, when this is thickened, like you can see over here, the canal tends to narrow from the bottom. And you see that the roundness of the bottom of the canal starts getting flattened. And that is a sign of lumbar stenosis. So in this patient, if you just do a microdiscectomy, you're not, you're not winning the uh, battle because the canal has to be widened. So a disc hernia, in the presence of a lumbar stenosis, where you will have to do a discectomy, becomes a covert sign of instability. Is that um, is that understood by everyone? It's very very uncommon for you to need a a, a disc surgery in uh, or a discectomy in place uh, while doing a lumbar canal stenosis surgery. Okay, so if you need that, you probably are talking of a covertly unstable situation. Okay, so let's move forward. Any questions so far? So now I'd draw your attention to, uh, or all of you should have an attention to looking at the actual section of the MRI and seeing the alignment of the facet joints. And you should realize that the facet joint, which is on your left, which is a more vertical or sagittally oriented facet joint should worry you. And I'll tell you why. So the uh, 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 facet joint, which is more vertical is surgeon unfriendly. A facet joint, which is sleeping or more coronal is surgeon friendly. I hope I'm clear. And let's see why. Because when we do lumbar canal stenosis surgery, we actually go through and cut this. We are doing what we call a medial facetectomy. A laminectomy is just an approach. It's not the surgery because the uh, surgery is not done to release the spinal canal. It's done to release the root canal. The spinal canal, unlike the cervical spine, does not contain the spinal cord in the lumbar spine. It contains nerve roots. So doing a laminectomy will not solve your patient's problem. You need to go down and cut the medial facets to release the nerve root canal. And while doing that, you're actually taking away the buttress effect of the uh, of the facet joints. So joints that are more vertically oriented, uh, when you cut the medial canal, as is very, very apparent on this diagrammatic, those joints start getting unstable. While on the other hand, if it's a coronally oriented joint, when you cut that, you still have a lot of facet joint available to stabilize the spine. And hence, this becomes a stable situation even after a decompression. Am I clear? Any questions? Is it too much information or is it too basic information? Anyone? Sir, bilateral uh, facetectomy is required or unilateral is required? 
No, it's always bilateral because lumbar canal stenosis is almost never unilateral, but it is medial facetectomy. It is not facetectomy. You're just taking away the inner one third, at best the inner one third of, the, of both the facets. So the stable outer two thirds is, is uh, still preserved. Sir, in intraop, how do you know how much to remove? So um, okay. once you remove it, you should be able to visualize the nerve root from the top. After you remove the facet, because when you do a laminectomy, you will see the thecal sac. All of you have done laminectomies. You will see the thecal sac, but you will not see the nerve roots. And when you, we normally use osteotomes, but you can use uh, rongeurs also. When you start removing the lateral recesses, you will start seeing the nerve root. You should, you should be able to put uh, your uh, pen field inside, fiddle with the nerve root. If you don't see the nerve root escaping on the side, you've not done enough. And that's one of the commonest causes of a poor result after a lumbar canal stenosis surgery. Once again, as and when we put that video up, you'll be able to see because we've got videos demonstrating this very effectively where you do lateral recess uh, osteotomies and the canal opens up, root canal. Is that okay, Mustafa? So where, where, will you, where will you put the videos in there? So, you know, we're trying to collate them, but since the group is live, no, it doesn't mean like okay. even next week, if you have questions, we'll be answering them. It's not like today we're going to shut the group. Yes. You got it? So what I can do now, for example, is by today or tomorrow, I'll at least send you pictures of this question that Mustafa asked. That how do you know that you've done enough? So I have very good pictorials. It's not included in this presentation, but I can put pictures on the uh, WhatsApp. We've been asked not to put videos on WhatsApp. That's the problem. So we're going to put them on that YouTube channel and um, uh, whatever we have, we're trying to collate them and we'll let you know as we know. Is that okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, like I said, if any of y'all are going to com be coming to Bombay and if we have surgeries lined up, you just shout out and we'll... Uh, make it possible for you to scrub up. So you'll actually see the technique because the videos never do justice. You'll never really understand what's going on because the videos just snip and show you the highlights. But to really see the surgery happening, scrubbed up next to the surgeon, uh, guys like you with one surgery, you'll learn the whole technique. And that's the only way. And personally, even today, I travel at least once every year to learn a new operation from a surgeon. So that should be the learning. And the, what, what we're doing is just attracting you to learning this is not really learning okay sure uh, thank you. yeah so let's move on to uh, uh degenerative scoliosis until now whatever i have said if you have questions you can go back and ask me there's no problem but for the sake of time we need to make the move so uh degenerative scoliosis is an asymmetric degeneration of the discs and again i want you to make an analogy on your head that when you wear your shoes and walk your shoes wear out but sometimes when you're, when you're con recurrently stepping wrongly, the shoes wear out uh, asymmetrically. And that uh, causes the center of gravity to move to the side and that makes the shoe wear out faster in that asymmetric manner. And that's exactly what happens in a degenerative lumbar canal stenosis. So it's that same process that I showed you in the first slide where the disc is gradually degenerating. But here the degeneration is asymmetrical for an unknown reason. And that self-propagates and causes that angle to from one degree to become two degrees because the center of gravity is gradually shifting. And it starts at one level, but then proceeds to three and four levels. The big difference here, uh, as against an AIS, is that this is happening because of degeneration. So the facet joints are also, along with it, getting degenerated, which does not happen in AIS. And hence, uh, the you know, there is things like subluxation, translation, which is happening, which is not happening in AIS. There's concurrent LCS that is happening, which is not happening in AIS. So we'll talk about those differences. So um, the pathology always starts at the disc. And uh, this is an instability which causes the, uh, the degenerative scoliosis. So don't think of this as a scoliosis. Think of it as an advanced asymmetrical degeneration. Scoliosis is just the name tag that you give it. Okay, And when a patient who comes with um, degenerative scoliosis will come with different types of pain. One could be just pain in the back from scoliosis. Uh, there could be imbalance, which makes the patient, uh, you know, a bit difficult to walk and muscle fatigue. Now, these two are becoming more and more in focus. And now we realize that this is actually because of degenerative kyphosis rather than scoliosis. So uh, you must have seen the picture of the cone of economy. So when we stand up, the center of gravity is right in the middle and hence your muscles are optimally used. But 
with a degenerative scoliosis, there is a flat back that starts happening. So the normal arch of your lumbar spine, which is keeping your center of gravity at the right place, starts to move forward and the person starts to drop forward. And just to stay vertical, his gluteus, his pelvic muscles and his extensor muscles are working overtime, working two or three X. And hence they get fatigued and their ability to move around gets significantly compromised. And that's not because of the scoliosis, but because of the kyphosis that is associated with scoliosis. The kyphosis was never spoken about because in the lumbar spine, you start with a negative kyphosis. And hence even a zero degree would not be technically called, called kyphosis, but a zero degree lumbar spine is actually a 40 degree kyphosis. I hope that is clear. And as expert surgeons, this is how you should visualize the lumbar spine. The minute you find a person with a degen scoliosis, you keep that x-ray aside and see the lateral x-ray and see the patient clinically in the sagittal profile and then start making your judgments because that now is a far bigger problem than the scoliosis. Is that clear? Right. So uh, then they may have, of course, degenerative low back pain because of facial arthropathy, disc degeneration, and then they could have claudication. The claudication could be because of lumbar stenosis, because this is a degenerative condition. It could be because of the stretch of the nerve roots on the convex side, or it could be because of the compression of the root canal on the concave side. And that could then come with radicular pain or with true claudication. All right. So those are the different pains that people come with. Now, uh, here is a case in point. This is an elderly lady, osteoporotic, with significantly advanced degenerative, spondylo, uh, degenerative scoliosis. And she comes with a progressive reduction in the inner activities of daily living. The question that you as a surgeon who's going to treat her will ask yourself, should I do a decompression? Should I do only an apical decompression? Should I do stabilization? Should I fix long? Should I try to correct the deformity? Now, how do you think through this? Always remember that the patient comes with very simple complaints. The patient does not say that I have degenerative scoliosis. The patient says I have back pain. When I stand, I get fatigued. My butts hurt. My legs hurt. When I walk, I start getting claudication. You listen to those complaints and stop analyzing uh, what you're, you've been taught in analysis of scoliosis. This is a lanky type 5. It is a 50 degree cob angle. The stable vertebra seems L5. Those don't hold value in your evaluation in your first evaluation of the patient. So at this point, you should remove the surgeon's lens, hear what the patient is saying, and then take a call. So the first pearl in the treatment of degen scoliosis is that you shall not treat the x-ray, but you should look at the patient's complaints because there's a huge difference. The word scoliosis makes you go on a different track. So instead of calling this a scoliosis, you can see there are so many differences, as you can see in this slide, between uh, degenerative scoliosis and adolescent scoliosis. Unfortunately, both are called scoliosis. They are completely different diseases. So in your mind, just separate the two. Never try to call a, a degen scoliosis as a scoliosis, but rather uh, call it a complex lumbar canal stenosis. So you look at the person as a lumbar stenosis with some complexity. Don't look at it as a scoliosis with some nerve compression. And then you will start thinking right. Okay. I hope I've uh, drilled this into your head because if you think like this, you will end up making more op optimum decisions in this very difficult group of patients to treat. Because as you will see in some slides ahead, the uh, complication rate of surgery in degenerative scoliosis is 30% in the best hands. And that's not at all a pretty picture. And I have actually lost uh, two patients of degen scoliosis. Just imagine. So um, it's not an easy, easy picking. All right. Am I clear? I hope I'm uh, making that inroad into your head on how you should think when you see this patient. So here's yes, another sir. lady. Thank you. There's another lady who comes with a uh, you know, short history of uh, leg pain. So as you can see from the first line, she has a long history of claudication, but she's okay with it, which means it's a compensated lumbar stenosis or compensated claudication. Her lifestyle has not gotten affected with it. And over the last five or 10 years or whatever, there's no significant deterioration in that. But today she comes with an acute right thigh pain of one month history, uh, duration. Now, if you listen to her, this is what you would hear. But if you look at the x-ray and the MRI, you will say, boss, I think we should fix her from L5 to T12. You will ask your colleague, should I do a rod derotation maneuver? Should I do a distraction? How do I retain the lordosis? Remember, by doing any of this in a 66-year-old, you're putting threatening to put a Ferrari engine in a Fiat car. And the Fiat car is going to give way under the pressure of the Ferrari engine. So you want to look hard and find a reason to not do that. Uh, if you see her complaints and then you see her MRI, 
there's a match between her recent complaint and her MRI scan. And this person should go for what she's come for. And you go and do a, a one short decompression with a discectomy and she'll relieve her symptoms and then put her onto, onto spinal rehabilitation, including treatment of osteoporosis. Keep, him, keep her under observation, but don't commit to a long, big surgery for that patient. Is that clear? So here, because there's more leg pain and almost no back pain, you'll be able to cope with a, sh uh, with a short decompression. Now, the question that comes into your head is this last one, the point number four. That if I decompress now, what's the likelihood that this girl or this lady will progress in terms of her uh, uh, of, of her uh, coronal plane deformity? And, uh, uh, you know, what are the chances that after 10 years she comes with us advanced scoliosis? Now, there are very clear markers which uh, tell you that this scoliosis is going to go out of control. And if you see these markers and if the person is slightly younger, you may discuss this weigh the pros and cons and offer her a preemptive surgery for a scoliosis. So the first is a higher magnitude curve. How magnet, How high? So curves that have gone over 30 degrees in Cobb angle are curves that should be considered high risk for further degeneration. Older people, because of their fragility and sarcopenia, their frailty and sarcopenia tend to spin off faster. People with more osteoporosis because of sarcopenia tend to spin off faster. People who have a lateral listhesis, which means a subluxation of the bone, the bone is not in one, one tram line, but it's getting pushed off. Or someone who's got a significant rotation at the apex, which is not a hallmark of degenerative spondylolysis. It's a hallmark of AIS, but not a hallmark of degen spondy or a degen, uh, uh, degen scoli. The, these are the people who are likely to spin off and they should be given far more prioritization of uh, fixation. And what is not written in this review is lateral is a sagittal profile. And we'll talk about that as we go. But after seeing these, you should also look at the sag profile because these only tell you markers for the scoliosis progression, but not of the uh, uh, kyphosis progression. I hope I'm clear. So in this particular case that we discussed, you'd rather do less than more and get away with uh, giving her symptomatic relief and then put her on to rehab threatening her with a big operation in the future, which is high complications. So she will follow the rehab that you've asked for. Because rarely, patient, rarely do patients with long-standing symptoms present for surgery. And uh, people with long-standing symptoms, someone who comes and says, I have 10 years of this problem, they really don't benefit from the surgery that you do. Uh, while people who significantly have a new problem, which is uh, significantly different from their long-standing compensated problem, they become good candidates for a good result of surgery. And if you have a specific cause, you address that rather than addressing the pathology. So that's one strong message. So listen to the patient's complaint carefully and ask a detailed history before you make the call. And um, then the question is that if you need to fuse as per the criteria, would you like to do that small operation that's shown on the left? Or would you like to commit yourself to this big, huge operation that's written on the right? So the simple answer to this question is that if the sagittal profile is going off, you should go long because a short operation will not work. But if the sagittal profile is fine, you do a small operation, it will work, right? So because the concern of the apical fusion, of course, is that you may you know, cause increased scoliosis above and below and um, more than that, increased kyphosis above and below. So you should be aware that the kyphosis is your bigger enemy than scoliosis, right? And uh, the one of the pearls here is that for every degen scoli that you see, you should have what we do, we call a sitting supine X-ray. It could also be a standing and a supine X-ray, but you should have a comparison of how the spine looked on the AP view on loading and on offloading, and on the lateral view on loading and on offloading. And that makes you that tells you. For example, here uh, you can see a significant difference in the kyphosis the minute the patient stands up, which could have fooled you when the patient was lying down. So gravity is really the enemy of this patient and you want to make sure that you don't end up like this. This is one of my patients done quite early in life, uh, in my life, where I thought I'd done a very fancy operation, but it gave way in the next few years because I'd not respected his sagittal profile. I still see him. He's still traveling the world with this. He's got a big bursa where that uh, implant is sticking out, but um, uh, he's not opted for a re-operation and he's managing his life. Any questions so far? Okay, so the pearl is don't miss this. Yeah, if anyone has a question, just speak out. Don't wait for me to pause because we're just going ahead like a, you know, like a motor. And uh, 
it may be hard for us to uh, remember what we spoke some time back. So just unmute yourself and ask the question. Because now we are moving to a very critical part, which many of us think is BS, but it's actually not. And that's the sagittal parameter. So when the sagittal parameters first came up, uh, that happened in my late after my fellowship, which is the early, early 2000s, uh, we thought that this is too much ado about nothing. But after I'm done with the next few slides, you'll realize what the real problem is. And uh, I ask you to pay some special attention because this is a very simplified and a very understandable method to know why we should think about the sagittal parameters and why we should think about how the lateral x-ray or the person looks on the sagittal view uh, when you're planning to fuse a spine, especially a long fusion. Okay, so this boils down to someone who's... Uh, setting up for a long lumbar fusion. For a one-level L45 spondy treatment, this is really not relevant. And someone who you're not fusing, again, this is not so relevant. So uh, as we grow older, the column of the spine, which is really the balance, it starts to collapse forward because the discs degenerate. So they say life is a kyphosing event. All the elders in your family, you will see that from an upright position, they start to straighten up the butt starts to go in and they slowly start to fall, uh, fall forward. All right. This is what happens to your column as we grow. Okay. Now this, this column, which is supposed to be the whole uh, base of your spine, has a tilted uh, or, or the, the, the main pillar of your body has a tilted base. The pelvis, which supports this column is actually tilted. So that's where the problem begins. And this tilted base has to then balance the column. All right. So that's one problem. Now, in fact, this base is almost like a sphere. So imagine that there's a building erected on top of a sphere, which is mobile. Okay, that starts to make you think about how this column now needs to balance. So it's not just a stack of bones kept one on top of the other. All right. Now, this sphere being mobile, so your pelvis is mobile and your pelvis can be forward tilted or backward tilted. Uh, it becomes difficult for us to even gauge whether the sphere is forward tilted or backward tilted. If it was a square, if it was a block like this, you could easily know if the block is tilted forward or backward. But with the sphere, it's impossible to know whether this person's pelvis is tilted forward or this person's tilt, uh, pelvis is tilted backward. We call that anti-version and retroversion, right? So the first pelvic parameter that was described is the, uh, you know, the pelvic radius, as you can see on the right, which means that the hip joint um, the center of the hip joint seems to be the center point around which this sphere revolves. So if you're able to use the sacrum as one of the markers to know, to judge how the pelvis is. So you judge how the sacrum looks in view as with the center point of the uh, hip. You may be able to know how the pelvis is aligned. That was the first marker. So here are three images which tell you, you know, whether the pel in, in relation to the hip is this pelvis rotated in the front or rotated at the back. Okay, so far so good. So if we had a dial that could tell you which way this clock is rotated or which way this sphere is rotated, life would be much better. So you would know whether it's, you know, move backward or move forward. And uh, then you can determine how the spine is based on it, right? Move backward or move forward, right? So this dial uh, is the base of pelvic parameters and the two simple parameters that you should know is um, the sacral slope because it tells you the angle of the sacrum in relation to the horizontal and the pelvic tilt which tells you the angle of the sacrum in relation to the hip center of the hip. Is that clear so far? So these are eyeballing markers. They You don't need measurements for that. You just eyeball and you know oh this sacrum looks tilted sacrum looks more horizontal so this pelvis is probably tilted forward or this sacrum looks more vertical this pelvis is probably uh, tilted in uh, retroverted like tilted in the other way is that clear so that's the sacral slope and again as surgeons who are in clinical practice this is something that you can keep your eyes open for okay now the problem gets slightly more complicated this is not enough if this was enough it would be very easy anyone with a sacral slope or a more horizontal sacrum becomes a high pelvic tilt and then you're sorted. The problem is slightly different now that you know how the version is. The problem is that the column that on which this, uh, you know, which this sphere takes up is a curved column. 
it's not a straight column and this curve is of variable curvatures like some people have a very curved lumbar spine some people have a more straight lumbar spine no two people have the same lumbar spine so the angles of the column the curve in which it is uh, placed by uh, when you're born or when you develop is variable and that suddenly gives you two variables. Like someone could have a front tilted pelvis with a high lordosis. Someone could have a back tilted pelvis with a high lordosis. Someone could have a front tilted pelvis with a low lordosis. So this combination is with two variables. There's nothing steady. None of these two are steady in the world or in the population. Am I, under, uh, am I understanding or are you understanding what I'm saying? So the picture on the left is diametrically different to the picture on the right, though more or less they look the same, right? And then this could be completely different, okay? Is it clear? So here's a case in point. Uh, this person uh, tried to give this person a good lordosis by doing a surgery. And you can argue that this is a well-done surgery in terms of lordosis, even done an osteotomy here. But uh, in this case, the dial was tilted in the front, so, but by doing this, uh, he didn't actually think about the pelvic dial or the way the pelvis was rotated. So, the minute the patient starts to stand up, the pelvis starts to correct itself and the spine dropped off. Okay, this is just trying to wet your appetite into the next. So, you, as we know, we need a constant here. And the uh, this constant was given to us before Ruzuli by these folks. And that was called the PI or the pelvic incidence angle. So, the Eureka moment was somebody realizing that in every person, there's a fixed pelvic incidence angle. The sacral slope could be variable. The pelvic tilt could be variable, but his PI is identical through his life. Okay, so the PI is the sum of the sacral slope. As you, This is self-explanatory, this slide. But the reason why the pelvic incidence angle, which sounds a bit complicated, like how, why would you want to do a pelvic incidence angle? Even the name is complicated. Uh, because that's the constant that you have in your body. And now that you know the constant, which means this is a guy with a 40 degree PI, that constant remains. So then you can build up everything around that. Okay. Am I clear so far? So the beauty of the pelvic incidence angle is that uh, it's constant, but there's one more beauty of the pelvic incidence angle, which Ruzuli found out is that a person's lumbar lordosis is always within 10 degrees of his pelvic incidence angle. So suddenly we got in and this was done by, uh, you know, long uh, like population studies. Like they just studied more and more people and they realized that the pelvic incidence angle remains the same in that person. And that person's lumbar lordosis, a healthy young adult or a healthy person with no complaints, his lumbar lordosis is within 10 degrees of his PI. So now if you see a pelvis, all you have to do is calculate the PI and say if this guy's lordosis is normal, or he's losing his lumbar lordosis. Okay, so someone with a 20 degree lumbar lordosis could be a normal lordosis. And someone with a 50 degree lordosis could be normal. But is that normal for that person? You find out his PI and you will know. Okay, which also then tells you that it, at the end of the surgery, where do you want to land his P, uh, lumbar lordosis at? So for example, in this case, this person, uh, the, the surgeon gave him like a good 30, 40 degree lordosis. But that did not match his PI. His pelvic incidence angle, as you can see cursorily, is maybe 70 degrees. That's the pelvic incidence angle. So he sir, felt... One question. Yes. How to find out the PI, sir? So that you have to have a standing lateral x-ray, which covers at least the top of the, you know, top of the femur, like this. The minute you do that, you have the center of the hips and you draw that angle, as you can see here. It's the angle that is drawn, sorry, between the uh, center of the hips to the center of the sacrum. Okay. That is one line that you want to draw. And then you want to draw a line that is perpendicular to the uh, end plate of the sacrum. Okay. This you will find in any book. But what you need is that x-ray. Is uh, Am I answering your question? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. understanding. Okay. So it, it is a little complex. It's not a visual or an eyeballing and you need a special x-ray. So we tend to discount it. But I've just tried to tell you why it is so important. And once again, I'm saying it is important if you're planning a long lumbar fusion. It is not important if you're doing a lumbar decompression or because when you do a long lumbar fusion, you're imprisoning the lumbar spine. You're going to give that person a permanent lordosis. 
And if this Lord who says is not what he wanted or what he needs or what he's supposed to have, you're going to create a problem. If you're just doing a lumbar decomp or a one level fusion where the remaining lumbar spine is flexible, you can stop worrying about this. So this specific deal is when you're doing a long, long fusion. All right. So like in this given case, the surgeon matched the PI to the lumbar lordosis. As you can see the figures, he did a standing x-ray and he found that the PI was 56 degrees. He found that the lumbar lordosis had significantly gone away. So he did a big operation. You can see cages here. You can see an osteotomy here. And he restored the lumbar lordosis to 56 degrees to match the PI. And you can see that this spine has remained balanced, unlike the last one, which gave way. Okay, now this is, um, while well, this one, where the surgeon did not match the PI, clearly you can see, uh, uh, you know, again, just to, you know, eyeball, this is the PI. This is that person's PI. Again, all of y'all will agree this is like a 60, 70 degree PI. But you can see the lordosis is given as maybe 10 degrees. So obviously the whole spine fell off until someone else came in and rescued that spine. Is that clear? Now, because I'm going to lead you to the next problem. This is not, we have not solved the problem yet. Okay, because the we are only spine surgeon and we look at the spine. So we say PI lumbar lordosis is set. I match the lumbar lordosis with the PI and I'm set. But the person is not a spine. The person is a person. He has multiple other joints. And hence, I draw you to the next part of the, you know, of the thinking that you should do is that you look at the patient as a whole. And you must realize, again, normally I like to stand up and demonstrate this, but it's difficult on the screen. But you must realize what goes on in the body when the lumbar spine starts to flatten. So as the lumbar spine start, starts to flatten, the body starts to fall forward. And to, pre to rescue this, the first corrective maneuver is that the thoracic spine flattens off and pulls the head backward and gets the body back in alignment. After this, the lumbar lordosis continues to drop and kyphosis continues to happen. So the next thing that the body does as a compensatory mechanism, it tilts the pelvis forward and once again pulls the body back to the center of gravity. And these are coping mechanisms so the person remains vertical and doesn't fall off. Now, this process continues. So the next thing the body does is it flexes the hips and then it flexes the knees to get the body back into alignment. So this pictorial that I've shown you really implicates or, um, or rather shows you what are the compensatory mechanisms besides the lumbar spine, besides the lumbar spine that are coming in the way to correct someone who's falling forward. And all of us are going through this. Now, where you find the person in this cascade will also determine what surgery you want to do. All right. So this is, uh, this is what is, is seen, right? So in short, if there's a person who looks like this, where the knees are flexed, the hips are flexed, the sorry, the hips are extended, the knees are flexed, the thoracic spine is flattened, and you just do an operation to match the PI, to match the lumbar lordosis, what would happen is that as soon as the person stands up, these compensatory mechanisms will give away because now the, you, the problem is solved and the person will straighten up. As soon as the person's hips become straight and knees become straight, the entire spine will start toppling over and uh, the surgery would have failed. Is that clear? Did everyone understand or do you want some more clarity here? So when, so, you, the elaboration, please. Yeah. So, uh, uh, when you look at the spine, you want to look at the position. You want to look at three more parameters. You want to look at how flat the thoracic spine looks. You want to look at how extended the hips are and how flexed the knees are. If the knees are flexed, the hips are extended. There's two more layers of compensation that have gone in to protect this person. And if you just try to give the person lordosis to match the PI, and the minute the patient stands up, as is, as you can see in this diagram, the legs will straighten up and the person will fall off. So in short, I'll give you a, a simpler version that in a clinic, when you see a patient who's lining up for a long lumbar fusion for his degenerative spine, aside of looking at the PI and the lumbar lordosis, you ask him to extend his knee, uh, extend his hip, make him stand up against the wall and ask him, take your leg back. And if he cannot extend his hip, that means the hip is already in full extension. That means this is a decompensated hip. Okay. So that's your red flag. That's your takeaway. And of course, you look at his attitude. And if the attitude looks like this lady here, where the knees are flexed and you can see the butt is flattened and the hips are extended. Of course, here you can't make that out. But the minute you ask her to move her leg back, she won't be able to move her leg back because this is a fully extended hip, which is camouflaged because of the kyphosis. 
uh, you will have to add that in your calculation of your correction. So here, if you just correct the lumbar lordosis to match the PI, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to create the, 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 comp the decompensation will happen after the patient stands up. Shashank, is that kind of clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, yeah. I know. I mean, th this is much better explained physically where I can stand up and show you all the, you know, every step that happens. It's not possible here. So I'm not doing it, but uh, you, you got to think about what I said. So in the end, if you can get the spine balanced, so you all know the a balanced spine is a spine where the center of gravity, that's a C7 plumb line drops within uh, 2.5 centimeters from the posterior superior corner of the S1. Uh, you have a balanced spine. So in the end, if you can get this, you know the gravity is gravity line is working in your favor. And uh, say, Sekaram, that's nicely sleeping, horizontal pelvis with a low pelvic tilt and uh, with no lumbosacral kyphosis. And uh, uh, this is a balanced pelvis. So if you have an unbalanced pelvis, so it has a low sacral slope, which means the sacrum is standing up. And, um, you, uh, you know, low sacral slope, a high pelvic tilt and a lumbosacral kyphosis, especially in a high grade spondy. You got to see the spinal balance. So an unbalanced pelvis with an unbalanced spine becomes a red flag. So uh, this is specifically alluding to spondy reduction, which we are not touching upon today. But if you have a high grade spondy, when do you need to reduce it? And when can you fix it in situ is a question that's commonly making the rounds. So if you have a balanced pelvis with a balanced spine, you don't need to reduce the spondy. If you have an unbalanced pelvis, you can see the features of an unbalanced pelvis here. With a balanced spine, you can still get away by not reducing it. But you have an unbalanced spine with an unbalanced pelvis, you have to reduce it. Otherwise, your surgery will fail. Okay. I know it's a lot of information, but maybe you should run over this again and again. You know, see this video again and again. And you can post your questions. But it's a bit complicated. But it is something that you cannot um, not think about if you're in the business of doing long lumbar fusions for older people. If you're not in that business, you can, uh, you know, have tea and leave this part of the conversation uh, aside. So uh, the short uh, message for you is that if you're planning a long lumbar fusion, do not just focus on the lumbar lordosis, but also see if the hip is maximally extended already and if the knees are in a flexed attitude. So these are the three attitudes you can see on the screen. The left one is normal. The right one is showing loss of lumbar lordosis, but the legs are fine. And the rightmost one shows loss of lumbar lordosis and extension of the hip along with antiversion, sorry, retroversion of the pelvis and flexion of the hips, uh, flexion of the knees. So um, flattening of the thoracic kyphosis, uh, uh, kyphosis of the lumbar spine, retroversion of the pelvis, extension of the hips and flexion of the knees. That's like maxed out on, on, uh, on the compensatory mechanisms. Is that okay? This is one of my cases. And as you can see, I've not done justice to the lumbar lordosis. Again, these are early days when we were not so sure. So what I've tried to do here is I just put a cage to get some lordosis. But like you can see, it is, it's done nothing to the lordosis. So the this person's lumbar lordosis seems to be quite flat. We've not been able to give her a good lumbar lordosis. So over time, uh, you see what happens. This is that same case that I showed you. Over time, the spine starts to undergo adjacent segment kyphosis because it's trying to balance itself and it gives away on balance. And there are two things that can happen. Proximal junctional kyphosis, which you saw in this picture, which is a self-explanatory condition and adjacent segment degeneration, which is not that amount to kyphosis. It's just an advanced degeneration that happens to the next level. Either of these outcomes would be if you didn't match the pelvic uh, parameters after doing a long lumbar fusion. Is that okay? So this is another of our patients, my patients, and you can see what she's been through. All because we could not, uh, you know, not restore her lumbar lordosis. She had a one level T lift easy. Then she came with adjacent segment degeneration because you can see her pelvic incidence angle is high. Of course, here we have not done a long segment fusion, but she's degenerated. So spine is getting stiff and kyphosed. The second surgery was probably the culprit because we left the lumbar lordosis unattended. The third time we were far more, um, uh, you know, far more scrupulous. And you can see we've done an osteotomy at L3. But despite that, we've not been able to give her adequate lumbar lordosis as we should have. So she promptly gave way over here. And eventually she landed up with a, you know, fusion that went up to the mid 
mid uh, or uh, upper thoracic spine. So uh, this is a picture just to say that don't trifle with the sagittal parameters in your uh, adult degen scoli surgery. Um, having said that, adult degen scoli surgery has high rates of post of complications, and uh, you know it is a bad operation to do worldwide. There's thirty to forty percent um, uh, rates of uh, you know problems. So the bottom line here is that uh, from what we discussed so far, do not treat the X-ray. Uh, keep your surgeon ego aside. So even if you've left the person with a deformity, as long as you've achieved your target of relieving your symptoms, you should be happy. Try to do less. Uh, try to do aggressive rehabilitation. The rehabilitation includes posture management, um, activity modification, aggressive osteoporosis treatment. Most of these people get teriparatide. And uh, of course, physical therapy, which typically involves stuff like aqua therapy, where there's less loading. Because if you do loaded standing standing exercises, the person will uh, kind of worsen her condition. So you may uh, something like an aqua therapy or lying down prone exercises help a lot. And then uh, you know think of the risk benefit ratio, and uh, choose prudently between uh, decompression alone and fusion. Um, and as far as degen listhesis is concerned, uh, do a fusion only if there's a definitive indication, and don't do fusions for all degen spondees. Because um, that adds to one more layer of um, uh, of complications. And finally, don't forget the covert red flags of a degenerative instability, which can uh, you know spring up later. All right, so we can stop for now. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll talk about it. Otherwise, we'll uh, move to some MRI discussions. Anyone has any questions? It is a bit exhaustive, I understand, and it's a bit confusing, but it's something you need to know. And I mean, this part can't be left unaddressed. Manoj, you have any uh, additional Sir, uh, how do you minutes? select the LIV in such cases, sir, for long segment uh, construction? So, uh, the, that's the point I was trying to make, that the LIV is not selected on the basis of a coronal image. Like in an adult, in a uh, AIS, we look at the LIV as a stable vertebra, less rotated vertebra, less tilted vertebra. That all does not hold true. You have to only treat this as an adult kyphosis. And yes. uh, LIV in a kyphosis is self-explanatory. If the you know if you have a lumbar vertebra falling within your uh, plumb line, that becomes your LIV. But if the lumbar vertebra is falling out of the plumb line, you have to go to the pelvis. Because there's and nothing about, lower you can go. And how about the UIV, UIV sir? UIV selection so, of UIV? Uh, again, the same thing that depending on where your... So ideally, it should be stable to stable. But the longer you go below, the longer you may need to go above. So if you go to the pelvis, you're invariably committing yourself to going to at least the mid thoracic, like at least T10, if not mid thoracic, the lower thoracic. Tosif, any comments? Uh, Aditya, any comments? You're muted, Aditya. No, no, we still can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, in long construct always, uh, do you aim to do uh, alpha S1 interbody uh, fusion? Ha, that's a good question. So, uh, one of the complications of a long construct, just, just one second. One of the complications of a long construct is L5-S1 pseudoarthrosis. Okay, so um, uh, invariably most of us tend to do interbody at L5-S1 because it is a, it's a big tall tower that is sitting on a, a weak hinge. And uh, the pelvis is your next bastion. So uh, the quick answer is yes. Sometimes in the very elderly person, if you're uh, getting the pelvis in the fixation, you can get away. Like if you're doing uh, S1 AI screws, Correct. you can sometimes uh, uh, get away. S2 AI screws, sorry. Okay. And are there any questions from other people? Otherwise, we'll quickly go through some radiology. Or do you want to take a break? Okay, quickly we'll go through re how to read the MRI and then we can um, take questions if you know. So the question that I would ask at the beginning is why should a spine surgeon know radiology? 
Okay, we are going to try and make this more interactive after the first eight or 10 slides. So everyone, please be aware and answer questions. So uh, one of the things is that when you read a radiology report, uh, the radiologist will write a disc bulge, even if you did an MRI scan and there would be a disc bulge. It would be in there. You'd rarely find a normal MRI, but the, uh, the meaning of a disc bulge is very different for a radiologist than it is for a clinician. All right. So you need to know what a, you know, what a, a significant disc bulge is or what a significant degeneration is compared to what the report says. All right. Radiologists are not clinicians. So here you have a radiologist who's reported a severe lumbar stenosis. And you'll see this case coming up again and again in this uh, short talk. But uh, this person on clinical evaluation had brisk knee jerks. So really, this is not even the MRI that you should have done. You should have asked for a higher MRI scan. But the radiologist is not going to say that. He's going to say, okay, there's lumbar stenosis. And then you just read the report. And as a clinician, you don't use your mind. And you'll end up doing a lumbar decompression, which will fail. Okay, and then they're definitely not surgeons. So what, how much stenosis is enough? For example, if you see an MRI like this, how many areas do you plan to decompress? The radiologist cannot comment on that. As a clinician, you need to know. So how much stenosis is significant? What is matching with the person's clinical uh, picture is what you really need to know. Okay, so with ba that background, uh, we just embark on understanding uh, the MRI. And I'm assuming that most of you know what is T1 and T2. These are just sequences spin sequences of the magnet in a t2 you get a better contrast because the it's black and white while in a t1 you get a lesser contrast which is gray and black okay so a more contrast is t2 mostly you should first learn to read t2 images because they are much easier to easier to read water looks white and uh, bone looks black okay so uh, in t2 images you can see the uh, sagittal image of the uh, uh, spinal cord or the or the spine as a very clear picture as though you as you see in the anatomy books but in the t1 image you look at a poorer contrast you should know how to read the actual sequence and invariably the measurements that they give of the spinal canal size is done in the cut that's taken at the level of the pedicle uh, you must remember that this uh, you know this measurement remains constant through your life your pedicles are not going to become longer or shorter in your life so it's really this section which is in the mid facetal section which is in the mobile unit of your uh, of your lumbar spine is the section that you want to uh, study when you look at the MRI image. It is not the section where the pedicle is fully seen. It's a section where the pedicle is not seen and the facet joints are seen is the key image for you, right? Uh, you know what the central canal is like, but like I said at the uh, top of the talk, the central canal is least relevant in the lumbar spine because it does not contain the spinal cord. It contains nerve roots. It's the lateral recesses which are out here, okay? They are the ones that you really need to see. And when you look at this image, what you want to see, again, I'm going to do some annotation and I hope I can get it back, is the central canal here, which is not so relevant. The lateral recesses here, which are more relevant. How much white you're able to see uh, uh, here, this, this white. Then you want to see the burger of the facet. So you have the outer and the inner facet and then you see how much there is in how much fluid there is in this facet joint all right again i'll rub this off just to get a better idea then you want to see how this layer looks the layer that i'm pointing out is an amalgamation of the facet capsule and the yellow ligament how black it looks and how thick it looks and eventually how much it is causing the canal to be to look trifoliate so if this is thickened like i'm drawing here uh it is um a lumbar canal stenosis while if this line which is the uh, face of the disc starts to look straight or starts to look convex it's the disc that's contributory and very often it could be both is that clear so these are all the things that you want to look at when you look at the actual section and again you'll see more of it so can someone say um, uh, unmute themselves and say what this image on the top on the bottom left is it a disc prolapse? Is it a lumbar stenosis? What would you call this? Anyone? I'm not able to see participants, so I can't pick you all out. The disc prolapse because the T2 image. Okay. This one. You can see this arch here, right? Numbers. But yes, we, uh, Vaishak. Uh, again, we can even see the ligament of hypertrophy. Yes, ascles. there is a hypertrophy and a thin black line here also. So it's actually a combination of the two. 
while in these images it's a pure disc prolapse can you see the difference yes, yes sir okay so that's something that you want to see you may not call this significant stenosis so you may decide that i don't want to address the stenosis but you must identify that there is a stenosis happening so this person if you just do a uh, discectomy he may come for a laminectomy and a lumbar canal stenosis surgery in the future while this person is uh, back to square one if you did a discectomy i think that's something that you need to know okay we talked about the lateral recesses and there's something called a lateral recess block so uh, i was always taught to then look at like divide this into two sorry divide uh, an axial image into two and you compare this half to this half and that's when you will know oh here there's no white i can't see any white so i i'll be able to pick up it looks very simple uh, right now when i'm pointing out but sometimes you can easily miss this fragment the fragment that is here so if you compare the amount of white over here to the amount of white over here you will know that there's a lateral recess block because this is what is traditionally known as the hidden zone we all look at this and we look at this or we look at that but we never look at this zone so you want to make an effort especially if the patient is symptomatic on that side to see how this side looks and this is one of those cases which is very clearly showing a mismatch between uh, you know the right side and the left side there's a very clear difference and uh, uh, this is what you should look for on a sagittal image this will show up as a keyhole sign so this is the keyhole and the keyhole will be blocked so uh, this is a sagittal image where we typically look at the mid sagittal image because that shows you the width of the spinal canal and it shows you central canal stenosis which becomes your key indicator for surgery but if the person has purely unilateral wow. symptoms you want to look at parasagittal image this is a parasagittal image where the nerve root looks like a, a keyhole and if this keyhole is blocked then you have a, what is called a keyhole sign you should also be train your eyes to look at the nature of the disc and is the disc white the whiter the disc the more the proteoglycan content proteoglycans harness water so more water more uh, more the shape memory of the disc as the disc starts to become black it loses its water content loses its proteoglycan content it's a chemical denaturation and hence it's a permanent irreversible change you cannot make this disc look white even if you put in stem cells this this then starts to fissure you can see these lines inside which are fissures inside the disc because the nucleus has dried up then it starts to change its shape as it changes its shape it can either end up bulging around or it can actually cause fraying of the end plates and uh, that can then lead to bony spurs which contribute to lumbar stenosis so this is a classic diagram that should be in your head when you look at discs so um, if there is a degenerated disc and a person has an acute pain a person with a black disc will complain of chronic back pain but is an acute radicular or back pain you will always find what is called an hiz high intensity zone this signals a, an acute tear in a chronic degenerated disc and the pathology is that the pathology is not the degenerated disc the radiologist will report three level degeneration he'll say this is the worst affected disc because it is indeed the most degenerated disc but this person symptoms are coming from here and that as a clinician clinician you should know all right any questions so the difference of modic signs like, uh, like yeah we'll come to that modic changes modic changes basically represent advanced uh, advanced degeneration so if the disc has become actually unstable ultimately it becomes so so uh, unstable that the bones starts to rub against each other and that causes edema of the effacing end plates got mm -hmm. it so while the disc is able to buffer the bone is unharmed but the when, when the disc totally loses its buffering capacity edema starts to develop around the end, end plate and that's modic changes so uh, simply put it's a sign of advanced degeneration okay sir thank you okay so um uh, you should know normal from a bulge bulge is almost universal in uh, everyone who's 50 and above versus a prolapse a prolapse is where the disc is actually extruded from its mother disc you can see the mother nucleus and a chunk of it lying separate but it is still contained uh, you know within the bulging annulus and then an extrusion where the disc is actually separated from the mother and then a sequestration of the disc can fall off and go to another place okay so these are terminologies used now i'd like someone to point out what they see here this is a 10 rupee question means if you answer this question i give you 10 rupees what is there any abnormality seen here anybody facetal hypertrophy uh 
this one so left sided fat settle degeneration with mm. the not really because you see the facet of, the facet is smooth it's not worn out and facetal degeneration will be seen better on the ct scan so that's not the answer i'm looking for there's something else uh, remember i told you to look at the hidden zone no cyst here sorry no cyst here no no cyst yeah look at the hidden zone the hidden zone that we spoke about does it look symmetrical If you learn to read this, you will save yourself a lot of blushes during a simple operation. So this is a conjoined root. If you look at uh, this is the central canal. This is that exiting root, which has exited from the top. And it's looking like an end on tube to you. When you compare that to the other side, it looks like an elongated line. So this, is, this one is just coming out. Okay, see some more. See these. This one, you can see a nerve root here. You can't see a nerve root. So clearly, there's some mismatch in where the roots came out. So this may not be conjoined, but it's a differential root exit. And this is critical because when you're doing a surgery, sometimes you can mistake that root for a disc because the root is low-lying. It's inferior. Look at this one where the root has already exited on the right side, but on the left side, it is still coming out of the thecal sac. Is that very, very clear? And here, you can see two nerve roots on the left and only one on the right. Okay, so as lumbar spine surgeons learn to pick up these in your actual images because these are the telltale signs that you're going to fall into a big trap when you're doing a simple discectomy. When you go down there, you'll end up cutting the root or you may, may end up retracting a root that's on your face and cause a neurology. So these are the different types of conjoined nerve roots. A clinical tip I'd like to tell you is people who have these kind of nerve roots are prone to deficits or acute pain with small discs. So the disc may be small, but if the pain is disproportionately high or if they've developed a foot drop or a toe drop, your mind's eye should say that this probably is a conjoined nerve root. So you go in imagining that there is one, even if you can't see it on the image or if you couldn't pick it up on the image. I hope I've gotten through because this comes more often than you think it does. Like I must see at least three or four in, the, in a year's stock of surgeries I do. So it's pretty common to see these. And if you miss it, you could cut it. Any questions? Sir, here one comment I want to make. Please. Uh, so, uh, if everyone is uh, noticing here, sir had uh, I mean, sir has shown T1-weighted axial cut. So, usually we give importance to T2-weighted image, but many times T1-T1-weighted image, in, especially in such scenarios, it's very informative. So, we have to be, uh, means we have to see T1-weighted image equally uh, as compared to our T2. So just wanted to make this comment. Even okay. though this holds good for in even cervical spine as well. Spot on. Okay. I think Dr. Aditya got it spot on. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? What we are talking about is the basis of some very, very simple problems that could be averted. Okay. Anyone here? What do you see here? Far lateral disc on the right side, sir. Perfect. It's a far lateral disc. A disc oh. where the central canal looks nice and wide. But the oh. disc is outside. And here the mid-sagittal section will be normal. But the parasagittal section will show what we call a keyhole sign. Which means the keyhole looks blocked here. Is that appreciable? Yes. yes sir. Okay. Uh, Vaisha, can you tell me how this person will present? He will present with the uh, higher uh, this one, uh, uh, root uh, uh, neurology. So they, can, they, they get a higher root radiculopathy. So if it's yeah, an right. F4-5 disc, They'll get an L4 radiculopathy. Very true. What else? Uh, and we will have to do a approach would be a whistle's approach for this. That's okay. How will they present? What is the difference? Severe pain. Severe yeah. Pain. yeah. Uh, the, why is that, it severe, Pankaj? That, why is there severe pain? You're absolutely right. It is the a dorsal root than your sir. Absolutely. They come with lacerating pain disproportionate mm. to the size of the disc. And they um, have rest pain also. And they have numbness and neurology sometimes. But the neurology is less often seen. Uh, they have, you know, they more commonly have um, uh, severe pain, rest pain. They get sensory symptoms and sometimes neurology. Because there is no, um, the, the, there's no root. The, the root can never get pressed against some wall. Neurology is not that common. And uh, approach, like you rightly said, uh, a better approach is a uh, will say approach, which is a extraspinal approach. 
and those who are not familiar with it so in the beginning of my career i would offer these people t lifts because i would go in i would have to take this facet down to reach this and then i would have to reconstruct it so people who are not familiar with the wilse approach which goes through this plane what where the arrow points out um uh, would offer t lift the uh, wilse approach is pretty easy because the muscle plane is uh, palpable and you go down and identify the tp uh, from the tp upper to the lower tp there's a intertransverse fascia which by biting the inferior edge of the transverse process you can just detach and right below that you will see the exiting root and right under that you will see fluffy disc the fluffy disc coming out okay we can talk about that approach later uh, train your eyes to look at the orientation of the facet joint how smooth they look yes question say again okay i'm guessing there's no question so train your eyes to look at how smooth the facet joints look how thick the uh, facet capsule looks how much fluid there is in the facet joint how does the cartilage look of the facet joint and what is the orientation of the facet joint so in a nutshell you should be able to identify stable from unstable facet joints all right so here you see sir, different and one question sir if there is a vertical facets yeah. then you will think about the fusion yes if you are operating a person whose spine has facets like this it goes in the favor of fusion it's not the only criteria like i said in the beginning Yes. but um it goes in favor of a fusion okay i hope that's clear so the difference between the image on the top and the bottom is that the person on the top has loose facets the person at the bottom has arthritic painful facets but not loose facets both these facets are actually quite coronal they are not vertical so in this specific case uh, you may override the fact that there is facet effusion and may just go for a decompression so it's not a single image that or a single uh, you know a factor that tells you whether you fuse or you don't fuse what do you see here you all know it's a facetal cyst all right so these are the different again train your eyes just spend some time looking at these images and try to look at them in the way i asked you to look at them you see how the central canal looks you see how the disc border looks you see how the facets are looking smoothness thickness uh, effusion compare that to over here don't miss that um the, the that hidden zone as we say um look at how the nerve roots look or the lateral recesses look for example in this image here you will find that the uh this lateral recess seems significantly com compromised compared to this one can you see that so this person will specifically come with a right radiculopathy or right nerve root pain can you see this one so uh, this otherwise looks like a normal canal but when you do the entire thing that i asked you to do you divide it look at how this looks and this looks you'll see a clear asymmetry and um, this person would be quite symptomatic the uh, they present with the right sided radiculopathy stroke claudication and their first uh, plan of treatment would be a root block and if does not does not work or if it's not diagnostic then you would you know even do a lateral assess uh, decompression Uh, like i said facial arthropathy is best seen on an on a ct rather than an mri scan but uh, if you suspect facial arthropathy and for some reason you want to prove it then you could do a ct scan we've been through this sagittal versus coronal facets the uh, look at how much fluid there is in the facet we talked about this and then you will look at the critical cog we discussed how to differentiate a disc from a stenosis or a combination Uh, on the actual image but on the sagittal image one easy way to do it is that you draw a line along the posterior border and along the posterior border of the thecal sac if there's something coming through on that line so what i'm saying is that if you start uh, visualizing this line hiding hiding the front you will see that there's something indenting there you can see that on this image that is a con uh, part of lumbar stenosis a person with just and then when you follow the anterior line whatever is indenting the thecal sac is the disc so in your head you should be able to separate these two and decide which is the bigger contributor and are both contributing so all i'm trying to say is that in your judgment if you uh, if this patient undergoes a microdiscectomy it's a fail this person needs to undergo a nerve root decompression whether you do an interlaminar or a, a laminectomy is your call okay is that clear so what is this image on the left what would you call it the image on the left this one what is your judgment anyone 
Integral disc prolapse. Yeah, it's a disc prolapse without stenosis. Very right. What would you call uh, this image? Let's hang on. This image. Yes. Canal stenosis. It's a lumbar stenosis without disc prolapse, but with how do the facets look? Vertical facets. Vertical, Vertical facets. So this completes your thought process. You may not be fusing this person, but you should know that he has vertical facets. All right. Now, someone tell me what is this? It's a lumbar canal stenosis with uh, disc prolapse. Very good. There's a very significant disc prolapse sitting there. Can you see that? Yes. So what would your surgery be here in this, this scenario? It would be a laminectomy with discectomy. The I'm facets look pretty it. good. The facets look pretty uh, you know, coronal. They don't look vertical. And there's no fluid. So probably a laminectomy with discectomy. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. We saw this case. This is the guy with significant claudication. So uh, if he has all the telltale signs, he has a tall disc on the top of a, uh, of a sacralized L5. You want to, uh, you know, get his actual images. You clearly see facet fluid. You want to get a dynamic X-ray and there you go. Okay. So here the trap is if you didn't look at this in that order, you look at this, then you look at this, then you look at this. If you didn't look at it, then you would end up doing a wrong surgery. You just do a decompression. We discussed this. Everyone knows. Anyone quickly shout out what is this? Cyst. Perfect. It's a facet cyst. How do they present? How do facet cysts present? Instability, no, they present with acute radiculopathy. Yeah. They're a sign of instability, but they present with acute radiculopathy. Not constant pain. I'm sorry. That's not the right answer. So invariably, you'll find a person with a compensated lumbar stenosis with a new acute radiculopathy because the facet cyst herniates stuff that is not, that is foreign to the neural tissue. So just like a disc prolapse causes inflammatory reactions on the, on the neural tissue, a facet cyst causes an inflammatory reaction. So they will have a long-standing history of back and leg pain with a sudden history of uh, leg pain, of significant leg pain. Okay, there are these extra spinal. The picture you see on the bottom right is extra spinal facet cysts, which are a sign of instability. So this person may present with instability pain, but this person will present with acute lancinating radiculopathy. What is the first treatment of a facet cyst? In the right setting, CT guided aspiration. Uh, if you're able to do it, CT guided rupture. If you're not able to do it, surgery. Okay, root block is not the right treatment. Okay, this is degenerative scoliosis. But today, as a well learned surgeon, what would you call this? Degenerative kyphosis. Complex. Kyphosis. Kyphosis. Yeah. Complex number sinus. Degenerative Complex kyphosis. Kyphosis. Don't get impressed with this curve. Look for this. Degenerative kyphosis. In these, in these cases, your sagittal images always look messed up. Because they are never done through one single plane because the spine is scoliotic. And you have to look for the actual images to decide whether the person has, uh, has uh, lumbar stenosis or not. So on this sagittal image, it looked like a completely crunched canal, but that is not the central canal. But uh, uh, actual images will continuously tell you how the central canal looks. And then the key question, how much compression is significant? So, you know, there's a clear difference between the image on the left and the image on the right. And to learn that, you need to constantly be seeing how the masters interpret it. And that is something that is very, very subjective. So you might find one surgeon has said urgent surgery for this MRI. And another says that this is moderate stenosis. You can just wait. So how do you determine that? That's an art and not a science. There, there are no measurements. So all the measurements that you see that the canal diameter is only 6.5. That is of no value because that is done at the level of the pedicle, not at the level of the degeneration. It is a visual plus a clinical judgment when you decide this is a significant compression. I hope it's clear. Okay, there's no other way of answering that question. You have to just keep keep seeing an expert interpreting an MRI and it becomes a second nature to you. Okay, the role of a contrast MRI is to create a better contrast. So you saw T1, T2, but you wanted a better, sharper contrast. You give a gado, gadolinium uh, uh, you know, dye, which is actually kidney sensitive. 
So if someone has a renal issue, you can't be doing that. And that can enhance a lot of structures. For example, this is peridiscal enhancement. And we'll talk about this a little later. What about this? This guy has a early neurology, but his MRI looks pretty normal, isn't it? Anyone can point out any flaw here? He has like an early corda equina. So when you find a normal MRI, but with dramatic symptoms, you just get a contrast MRI and see what it shows. Okay, the contrast picks up uh, anything that's uh, vascular, very highly vascular. So now you go back, you'll start seeing it here. The T1 shows it slightly, the T2 doesn't show it at all because it's a hypervascular tumor. And hence, T2 misses it out, like it doesn't show blood from uh, fluid. T1 slightly showing it, but contrast picks it up like a potato ball. All right. What is this now? Now we are coming slightly to the interactive part. Modic change. Modic change. Why not infection? Hmm? Why is this not infection? Who answered? Modic change. Maybe infection. Sorry? Maybe infection. Both the end plates are uh, edematous. So your first DD is modic change, second DD is infection, correct? Yes, sir. So how will you differentiate? So less inflammatory changes. Less? Inflammatory changes. But these are quite there, no? See now, so much is affected. So it's more inflammatory changes I'm saying. It's not less. Okay. Someone has written, Shikha has written, infection may show erosion of bones. So that's true. So one way of knowing whether this is infection or not is getting a plain x-ray. And a plain x-ray, if it shows sclerosis, is a sign of degeneration. So if it's degeneration, it's more likely to be modic changes. Okay. Another way is to do a CT scan. A CT scan is more clear because it can show you erosions in the bone. And uh, in a modic change, it'll, again, you will see very sclerotic kind of changes. And then, of course, you see the clinical picture and you look at blood markers. And that completes the story. I'm saying this because every few weeks we get someone with this MRI who's been, they're, they're guys who've flown in from abroad, Africa and US, who've been diagnosed as infections, spinal infection based on this, had been advised CT guided biopsy. When clinically, they're clearly not infective and you do the relevant tests and you confirm. Is Am I making my point here? So yes, these yes. are the modic changes. You should be aware. Type 1 modic changes are the acute modic changes where T1, it look, looks white. T2, it looks black. The, uh, as you go to type 2 and type 3, it is more chronic degeneration. So it's less and less relevant. But uh, the importance of type 3 is that they can mimic infection. It looks on an, on an MRI, it sometimes looks like infection. Okay. So these modic changes can look quite different and you should be uh, uh, able to pick them up. And anytime you are not sure, you can get a CT scan, get bloods or get a simple x-ray and be sure. Okay. What is this? Anyone? Again, it's a 10 rupee question. No, no, no. Yes. No one wants 10 rupees. Yes. Sorry. Mm. Okay. okay. Any better answer? It's just a small sign. The fatty infiltration Fatty infiltration of the bone. Anything else? What do you see here? Can you see That's my eyes? Yes, it's an acute small node. Okay, the classic okay. sign of an acute small node is you'll see this halo. You'll see the, uh, you know, you'll see some indentation on the end plate and a white halo around it. Now, depending on how acute this small node is, there'll be edema in the bone. So this guy will present with severe pain, like as though it's, it's a fracture. Remember, a small node is an intraosseous disc herniation. For a disc to herniate into an end plate, the end plate has to really be soft. So all these guys are typically osteomalacic. They have a metabolic bone disease in an acute small node. I'm not talking of just telltale signs of small nodes in adolescence. Where you just see little indentations on the end plate. I'm talking of people, they come very symptomatic. They even can have opposing uh, reaction to the end plate. So again, these often get uh, written off as infections. Hemangiomas will never be painful. Hemangiomas will have a uniform appearance and they will not have this double halo sign that you see in a acute small node. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Any questions? Okay, so next, this guy comes with acute low back pain. 
what is your diagnosis as a now fellowship trained spine surgeon? This is annual tear. Perfect. Well done, Pankaj. It's a degenerate disc with a high intensity zone there. So it's an acute annular tear which has caused the uh, caused the symptoms. So in so this is the image that tells you that. And on the sagittal image, this is the one that tells you that. So this high intensity zone causes an inflammatory reaction on the thecal sac. And that's why he presents with an acute muscle spasm because the body can't recognize the thecal sac compression from an inflammation. And all he needs to do is, what is your treatment? Rest and NSAID. That's it. Reassurance, rest, NSAID. It's like an ankle sprain in the back. That's it. Okay. Clear? Lovely. Okay. What is this? Again, as a fellowship trained spine surgeon, what would you call this? Somebody else? Yes? Yes. So, modic changes, you're right. Uh, this is actually like a auto-stabilizing osteophyte, which shows the, but that's not the pathology. You say canal stenosis here. I'd like a better yes. description of that canal stenosis. I agree canal stenosis, but as a trained spine surgeon, what? how would you, um, you know, declutter that diagnosis of canal stenosis? This is your canal stenosis here. Agreed? This part? Yeah. Yes, sir. What is this? I'll rub it off. Yeah. There's a disc additionally, right? Okay. Now, when the disc looks flat at the bottom, but looks bulgy at the top, you understand the difference? If you see this posterior vertebral line, the disc looks out. But in this vertebral line, the disc looks oh, in line. It's just the spread of this. Sorry? It's called pseudo bulge. Pseudo bulge. You can see the disc jetting out from here, but it's in line at the bottom. Do you appreciate that? If you follow this line, it goes along with the annulus. But if you follow this line, the disc is jetting out. That's called a pseudo bulge. And that's a classic sign of spondylolisthesis. So this is a spondylolisthesis with a disc prolapse with a lumbar stenosis. Have every has everyone understood? Yes. Yes, sir. Any doubt? Shikha, you should not write because I'm getting distracted. You should answer or not write because I'm ending up opening the chat unnecessarily. Okay. Any questions? I think my computer is hung at this point. Just give me a moment. So, any questions so far? What is the cause of acute radiculopathy, sir? In this patient? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. There are two likely causes. So, uh, let me, uh, sorry, let me reframe your question. If a person yes. comes with an acute radiculopathy over a chronic lumbar stenosis, what are yes. the possible three diagnoses? One is facet cyst. One is facet cyst. The other is yes. disc prolapse. And the third is yes. listhesis. Yes, yes. Got it? Also, in this case, it is Yeah, these are the three situations where a compensated lumbar stenotic comes with an uncompensated radiculopathy. Okay. okay. The other question, someone who has a compensated uh, lumbar stenosis comes with acute back pain. Not radiculopathy, acute back pain. What are the, uh, what are the causes? Listhesis. Okay. And... Uh... Just one more common cause. It's an osteoporotic vertebral fracture. Osteoporotic vertebral fracture. These are guys who fall into that age group. And sometimes they just have an end plate compression and that causes their pain to spin out of proportion. But that is back pain. Okay. So remember, these are very typical yes. daily clinical scenarios and you should be able to separate that in your head. Okay. Someone here, this guy comes with this history. What would you do? Dr. Bala, you can answer this question. Mm -hmm. So, we'll get the MRI of cervical spine too. Uh, see, look at this, normal upper limbs. Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. sir. Yeah, basically, ask for whole spine sequence. And uh, yes, yes, Dr. Aditya has actually published a superb paper on triple tandem stenosis. 
So there is a but I mean, how many patients did you have? Seventy patients or something of no? triple tandem, some very high yes, thirty patients. So it's not uncommon to have the same pathology running through the entire spine. So double tandem is known. Triple tandem is also known. Someone asked the question, how would you address it? You have to address the symptomatic part. So someone like this guy, you can't do a lumbar decompression. You should do a thoracic decompression, and along with that, you can offer a lumbar decompression, which you should because it's nearby. But someone who comes with an asymptomatic cervical compression and a symptomatic lumbar stenosis, you would normally offer him a lumbar decompression and keep the cervical stenosis only in his mind. Like let him know that he has it, but don't address it. Aditya, do you want to give us a few uh, comments about tandem and triple tandem stenosis? Yeah. So uh, basically, even though patient comes with uh, lumbar uh, symptoms of typical low back pain and radicular pain. Uh, but during the history part, uh, if at all, few uh, few times patients say that they have got imbalance while walking. So if at all, imbalance, if they say, it, uh, it's a situation-based scenario I'm talking about. So in lumbar stenosis, uh, unless and until patient is having any weakness in the leg, you are not going to expect any imbalance. So you, you should think that whether patient is having any cord level compression, either at dorsal spine or cervical spine, then retrospectively, you should uh, dig into the history that asks patients whether this imbalance is quite often, whether they have any upper limb symptoms. Because if they say that, okay, once in a while, uh, they find their hands uh, clumsy while buttoning their shirt. So these are telltale signs which patients are not aware of that. But from history, you can uh, dig into those history. And if at all, if you get any positive points in their history, so the, you can concentrate on cervical study as well. So as a dictum, whenever, in, even though patient come, uh, has come to you with low back pain and lower limb uh, radicular pain, the dictum is always ask for the, the, the prescription for your MRI has to be MRI lumbosacral spine with whole spine screening. It has to be a dictum. You cannot just write lumbar LS spine because many times there are concomitant dorsal and lumbar, uh, I mean to say cervical level compression also, which you can miss. And uh, once you see whole spine screening and if you see real compression at those levels, and if you ask questions about uh, that, you may get uh, positive history points. So in such scenario, scenario, you have to further investigate and you need to uh, uh, treat it accordingly, or maybe you have to contemplate tandem surgery. Now the question about uh, double tandem or triple tandem. So the commonest thing what we see in our practice is double tandem, uh, which is lumbar stenosis and uh, cervical uh, stenosis. So Sometimes it, you may see dorsal and lumbar combination also, but uh, the rarest combination is cervical, dorsal, and lumbar. Always these patients have total signs like imbalance. Uh, quite a lot uh, of patients, they complain of imbalance. So I always ask for three things. Imbalance, fine motor dysfunction. So how will you find out uh, whether patient has fine motor dysfunction or not? So uh, you ask them, do you, for male patients, do you find difficulty in buttoning their shirt? Is there any change in uh, handwriting or signature? Mm -hmm. If your checks are getting bounced back because of uh, signature is not matching, things falling down uh, in hand, from hand. Uh, so hand grip weakness. So fine motor dysfunction, you can find out by ways of these kind of questions and whether they have ball bladder issues. So uh, if at all any of these uh, things, if they say yes, also if, if at all dorsal spine, then dorsal spine, sometimes they complain of girdle pain. They feel tightness around their chest or in abdominal region. So these are telltale signs where the cord compression uh, you can think of and you can uh, dig into that history, ask for a relative, uh, um, uh, relevant investigations. So just don't concentrate on lumbar uh, thing always rule out dorsal and cervical regions. 30% of people with a cervical uh, disease have a lumbar degenerative disease of note and 30% of people with a lumbar have a cervical. So it's a very high number. You may Correct. not want to operate it, but you can't miss it and you can't. it can't be a surprise to yes. two years or two months after your surgery. I think it's a very strong yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, in this case, which uh, level operate for cervical or lumbar region? Aditya? So, uh, if you see uh, in such scenarios, we always 
uh, involve our neurologist also, friends. So uh, if at all I am confident that, okay, the patient's symptoms are purely and purely lumbar symptoms with typical back pain, radicular pain, claudication, and even though radiologically patient has cervical stenosis, but patient is not having um, neck symptoms or upper limb symptoms, though maybe you may or may not get signs also, then I can uh, counsel patient that right now you have cervical stenosis, but since you are asymptomatic, then uh, we can wait for that and we can just get away with right now lumbar uh, surgery. If at all in future, if you notice any upper uh, motor neuron-like uh, symptoms, then we can uh, do that surgery at later date. But if at all, if patient has any kind of uh, cervical or upper limb symptoms, and uh, that is getting uh, uh, substantiated by your neurologist colleague, then definitely I, I will think of doing both surgeries simultaneously. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, next. Anyone can hazard this guess. This person had a domestic fall and presented with back pain. What is this? Anyone? Yes. Compression wedging fracture. Wedge compression osteoporotic vertebral fracture. Is that your yes, diagnosis? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone else to compete with this diagnosis? Dr. Tosif, can you answer? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, uh, like uh, this shows posterior ballooning of the po uh, like uh, posterior cortex. It uh, uh, and again, like uh, with the history of domestic fall, it is the uh, like uh, a typical fracture. I would say uh, the uh, question in my uh, mind is uh, whether uh, <laughs> uh, like it is uh, like osteoporotic versus like uh, some disease pathology, especially some kind of carcinoma. Yes, so ballooning of the posterior cortex is a sign of a malignant fracture unless proved otherwise. Just keep that in your head. It's almost never seen in osteoporotic vertebral fractures. Is that clear? So here you can see the cortex or the height of the posterior vertebral body is not reduced, but is ballooned out. While in the next case, you will see a different scenario. You will see the posterior cortex is wedging out, but the height is also reduced. Okay. So Sir, uh, isolated vertebral fractures, can we uh, say that it points more towards uh, um, a neoplastic than uh, osteoporotic? 100%. So again, that's the other sign here. Everything else is fine and only one bone is fractured. What other sign is suggestive of this being a malignancy? It's an upper thoracic fracture. For yes. me, anything T6 and above can't be osteoporotic vertebral fracture unless proved otherwise. What are the other signs that could suggest osteoporotic uh, non-osteoporotic fracture? The color of the bone. Of course, here you don't see that. But if there's a permeative lesion across the whole body, the whole body looks discolored. It's a sign that it's probably a malignancy. Okay, thanks Manoj for that. So here we have a very different scenario. What are the three pointers here that suggest that this is a simple benign osteoporotic fracture? Number one, the location, thoracolumbar junction. Number two, there's an adjacent bone that also shows a compression fracture. And number three, which is the most important yeah. sign, is the Kumel sign. You can see fluid in the bone. The minute you see fluid in the bone, it is benign osteoporotic vertebral fracture unless proved otherwise. Is everyone very clear on this? Fluid inside the bone. That white line there, that's called a Kumel lesion. Okay. Now, these are atypical osteoporotic fractures. Both these don't show any of the signs we mentioned. They, in fact, sometimes can show soft tissue, which is actually hematoma. And these should be investigated, but they turn around back as an osteoporotic fracture. All right. So, I'm just trying to draw your attention. Both these were sent to me as tuberculosis of the spine, but they actually were benign osteoporotic fractures. So, all I'm saying is that you, as you go deeper into it, everything won't fit into a into one pattern and it's a it's an art, not a science. I just keep saying that. All right. Anyone here? This person has a low back pain of three months duration, which got worse after a load, road journey. What is your diagnosis? Yes. You think it's infection? Yes, sir. 
So why do you say that? Can you give me three reasons why this MRI makes you think of infection? Uh, in uh, it's hypo Yes, go ahead. It's a hypo intense lesion on the uh, T2 weighted image. The hyper intense on T2. Sorry. Hyper intense means white. Hyper. Looks more white. Hypo yes. on T1. T1. Yes. Sir. Suggesting fluid. Hypo on T1. Hyper on T2. Fluid. Fluid. Okay. Then what else? On the axis, we can see a lot of uh, uh, hyper intense lesions, sir. On as the as axils, as you can see all this. And all the psoas abscess as well. All this is like abscesses. Okay. This is not a, this can't be normal. You can see all this. Anything else? Paradiscal. Paradiscal involvement. Paradiscal involvement with significant collapse, end plate affection, right? End, pl end plates eroded. So this is a classic of an infection. Great, I'm happy. What about this one? Infection or tumor? Anyone? Tumor, sir. Most likely tumor, sir. Why tumor, Atif? Because single bone, single uh, vertebral involvement. Not involved, sir, in vertebral. Balloon involved. is there. Okay, why infection? Anyone in favor of infection? I'm not this, sir. It's, uh... So you can see so, the next bone yeah, also getting yeah, affected, yeah. like a spondylodiscitis. Okay, you can see soft tissue here, especially in the epidural canal. I mean, the, in the thecal sac, in the dural epidural soft tissue here. And you can see epidural soft tissue around also. So actually, this turned out to be tuberculosis, this patient. Okay, once again, I'm trying to draw your attention to that nothing is standardized and you have to think of everything, but, you know, pull out your resources. What about this one? Anyone? I don't want to hear infection. It's clearly infection. But what infection? The I'm talking of the image on the right, the lumbar. Pyogenic, the, pyogenic infection than tuberculosis. Why, why pyogenic and why not? Because it is, it is disk space is involved. You can see a white, bright disk space. Excellent. Disk space. Epidural okay. and and uh, very little osteitis and almost no soft tissue and no destruction. Yes. These are the classic signs for those who want to take a picture. These are the classic signs of pyogenic versus tuberculosis. Remember, tuberculosis is a very slow, indolent disease. So, a lot of destruction, a lot of soft tissue, a lot of bone destruction is seen before they present. Well, a pyogenic is an acute disease. It attacks the disc space. The disc space turns white. The bone inflames, but it's a dry lesion. There's no soft tissue. So, the symptoms are so overwhelming that the presentation is radiologically very primitive. While in uh, tuberculosis, the presentation is radiologically very advanced. Just remember that. Is that okay? Of and course. also one comment sir, yes. I, I want to make that in pyogenic infection, if you see the history of patient, there uh, there will be, uh, you will get some kind of immunosuppressing uh, point. Like they are a diabetic, they, they are CKD transplant. patients yes. or uh, yeah, renal compromise or the, uh, they are drug addicts. So some more other kind of immunosuppression uh, uh, point will be seen in them. Absolutely. So all these patients were sent as tuberculosis. Does anyone have any differential diagnosis on any of these? These are all different patients. There's two on the top, two at the bottom. Does everyone agree? Atif, do you think all these are tuberculosis? No, sir. In here. Hygienic hair. These are the real diagnosis, okay? Let's not go into the details. All I'm saying is that there's a trend to diagnose tuberculosis on radiology. Abolish that trend in your head. Do not diagnose tuberculosis radiologically. Make a biopsy. However strong you feel it is tuberculosis, it may not be tuberculosis. Because these are all patients who were on AKT and you know how much we missed out. Okay. So we won't go into the depths because that's a TB talk. But uh, tuberculosis is no longer diagnosable on radiology. Okay. Now we'll go quickly through some to some post-op MRI situations. So can anyone comment on this? This is a lady who has absolutely no symptoms after a lumbar decompression, but she thought she has to do an MRI every three months. So at three months, she came with an MRI and this is what it showed. How do you interpret this as the treating doctor? Dr. Maruti, can you comment? Yeah. 
Maruti Zople. Anyone else? Apurva. So there is a new disk uh, at L4-5 level. Okay. How will you interpret no this? Yeah. How <laughs> Yeah, so what will you do? Well, like, will you call it a disk or what? Ghost disk. Yeah, it's called a ghost disk, Nishan. So the, what happens is that when the surgeon done a discectomy, the annulus stays open and there's a dead space. So basically, this is a common visual after a discectomy. As long as the patient has no symptoms, you just let this go. This is not a recurrent disk. This is what they call a ghost disk, where an empty space is represented by fluid, stroke misinterpretation, the MRI with the annulus hanging out. Okay. Basically, post-op, if the patient is fine, don't worry about how the MRI looks. As against this one, what is different here compared to the last one? Why is this not a ghost disc? There's a fluid there. It's like a typical collection. No, no. The first is that she has severe leg symptoms. She's not asymptomatic. The second is that you can see the position of this ghost or whatever behind the vertebral body. You can't get a ghost yeah. disc behind the vertebral body. You will get it at the level of the annulus. And the third, like you said, there is fluid inside. So this turned out to be a large uh, recurrent stroke residual disc. All right. What is this? This person had a decompression and had persistent pain after the decompression. This is the pre-op MRI on the left, post-op MRI on the right. What would you say this is? HIZ. Come on. Acute so inadequate, inadequate lumbar decompression because of the lateral distance is still there. So lateral distance decompression. Come on, give a better answer than inadequate. Don't be inadequate. It's a wrong level surgery. The, the compression is here oh. and there's decompression done at the top. Right? So it's a wrong level surgery. Can you see that? Yeah. So because this will come to you in your clinic yes, sir, yes, sir. and you have to... Uh, you have to, you know, and give unfiltered opinion. Of course, you have to sugarcoat this and that's a separate topic in itself. How to sugarcoat someone else's mistake. But this is a wrong level laminectomy. It's not uh, inadequate. You can see the compression has not been handled at all. Okay, here's another case. This person had a good relief of leg pain for two years after a laminectomy discectomy and came back with left leg pain after a strenuous activity. So two years, she was good. Then she did some dandiaras and now she's got leg pain. What do you think? Would you, what would you do now? That's the MRI picture. You can see the laminectomy defect. Anybody? What's your next step? So two years post-op, you always interpret the MRI with caution and ask for a contrast MRI scan. And here you see the contrast MRI scan shows a complete enhancement. The whole area looks white. Can you see that? This is classic of a scar tissue. All right. So here, uh, root block is the treatment. Conservative treatment or root block. You don't do surgery for a scar tissue. As against this patient who had good relief of leg pain and then with a the strenuous activity has a severe pain with EHL weakness, which is which uh, suggests compression rather than inflammation. If you have only leg pain, it's inflammation. If you have neurology, it is compression. Again, this could have been scar tissue, but you have to get a contrast MR after, say, one year after surgery, if you have to do an MRI study, you should do a contrast. And what does this show? It shows a peripheral rim enhancement with an unenhanced center. And this is a uh, sign of recurring disc. Okay, a re recurrent disc has an inflammatory interface at the outside. So that picks up the dye, which is metabolically and vascularly active. And hence, it shows a white around a black in the center. Clear? Everyone followed? Yes. So here's another case with a thigh radiculopathy after lumbar decompression. Again, if you do a contrast, you see a very clear peripheral rim enhancement. All right. So this is a recurrent disc. Okay. What about this person? She had a lumbar decompression and after some time came with um, thigh radiculopathy. Even if the MRI looks clean, you have to look for the relevant route. So you ask for, sorry, you ask for the upper MRI. And this is an ASD. Okay. And remember, ASDs can happen even without fusion because ASDs are as much natural history 
as they are adjacent segment degeneration. Okay, anyone wants to give a guess here? What is this? In a short time after the lumbar surgery, she's developed. Oh, yes. Hematoma. Correct. Spinal hematoma. Okay. And what's the treatment of this? Re-exploration and draining of hem hematoma. Uh, if there is significant pain not responding to conservative, easy conservative maneuvers, uh, you would, and if there's a deficit, of course, you would decompress. Otherwise, you can just steroid and rest them because there's literature to support both. So today, if there's a progressive pain and neurology, you decompress. Otherwise, you steroid and rest. Okay, what are these? There are three different scenarios. And uh, again, because we are rushing out of time, this is a hematoma. Train your eyes to see what a CSF looks yeah. like. Okay. Any questions? Once you see this, just... Stare at all these images so you will get all the information that you need. In the one where there's infection, you will see the end plates are affected, there's vertebral body changes. The one where there's CSF, the color of the fluid is extremely white compared to the hematoma, which is shaggy in color. And the one on the extreme bottom right, there is some whiteness, but it's not causing any compression. So this is the dead space that you left behind. Clear? Okay, this guy had a two, my patient, two level T lift. Post-op left radiculopathy. What is the next plan if you are the surgeon? Anybody? This must have happened to all of you, right? Tosif, next test. Next thing. So, uh, if uh, like pain uh, left... Uh, lower limb uh, pain is significant and it is like affecting will get MRI and CT. Yeah, basically the take home is that if there's an instrumented spine and you want to re-image it because the pain is significant, you get a CT. The MRI will not show the position of the implants. The CT is a must. So your first test is a CT. You could do a CT with an MR because it could be a hematoma also. But a CT is a must. An MRI will not pick out this, you can see the screws inferior, okay, which an x-ray may not pick out. Like if you see this uh, lateral x-ray of this post-op uh, lateral x-ray, you will not, you would have thought this is fine. But when you do actual images and you do, you know, parasite images, you see that the screw is inferior and this is an intraop image, the screw in, indeed, you can see the screw there. It was indeed medialized, inferior and medial. Invariably, it's inferior and medial. Okay, so take home is that post-instrumentation leg pain, always do, um, uh, uh, Always do a CT. I think we'll end here. We've had a long discussion. It's taxing. And uh, we've tried to cover everything. Is there something that is left uncovered? Something you want to ask about today? And um, of course, we have a huge battery of very, very learned guys in our unit. So if you feel that there are things that need to be discussed, you want them to be discussed, we could take a couple of more classes as we go. I'm sure Tosif, Manoj, they're all ready to uh, fire away. Okay. Sir, uh, may I ask one or two? Of course, of course. Sir, uh, uh, like uh, we have covered everything about the disc, but like uh, 0 0.2 to 0.3% of the patient will come with the intradural disc. And uh, like on image, uh, it is very challenging or very difficult to diagnose it on the uh, MRI especially. So what are the key pointers to diagnose intraduce? So if there's a huge disc, a huge disc, you should consider the possibility of intradural disc when you're going in. Okay. The only other thing is that you can, you often find the disc detached and you find almost a continued, actually I had an image which I didn't keep because I thought it would be too high end. You sometimes find a continuity of the anterior thecal sac. So you find a huge disc, but almost looks as a cyst. So these are the, in my opinion, these are the two, but more importantly, when you go in, uh, if you don't find a disc, the next step you do is that you palpate the thecal sac with your finger, press it, and you will find some resistance there, which you're not supposed to find. Just fearlessly open the thecal sac and you'll find a disc. Because if you miss it, 
the person is left with the symptoms. I've, I've dealt with one such situation where an interdural disc was missed. The surgeon went in, didn't find a disc, closed up and the lady was as bad. So you went in again, you felt, you cut open and the disc presented itself. So it's a good question and uh, you got to be aware of it. But I think intra-op, you can't miss it. Anything else? Anybody? Assuming not, we can... Aditya, you want to say something? No, 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 sir. Perfect. So we because, can wind up for yeah, the day. What we'll do is, because we have almost actually finished our fellowship right now, but we will keep the group alive and we'll keep it alive for almost forever. So you are always are, you know, our gang and we should keep, uh, you know, asking each other questions, putting in queries. Someone has asked a query about a pot spine, which I'm going to answer eventually. So uh, we'll go, uh, you can even post your cases and ask for our opinion on what we would do. You would find that six or seven of us would give you six or seven different opinions. And like I said, if you have some topics which you feel are burning and we feel that more than one person in the group wants it, we are happy to extend this further as a, you know, just as a follow up. And um, we will put up surgical videos that you have been asking for. And we'll inform you on the group when these one by one, when they get put up, because they're very scattered. They're very different, different videos, but we'll put up what we can. And um, like I said, you're welcome to meet, come by, or there's a big ASICON coming up in Bombay in January, which I'll encourage all of you all to attend, where we can all meet in person. We can even have a small batch reunion and have drinks. So everything is possible. The fact that you all have signed up suggests that you all are enthusiastic spine surgeons. And um, it's been a very, very happy journey for the last three months. Aditya, you, you've you been the leader for this. Do you want to make some concluding remarks before we sign out? So uh, the last two, two and a half months where uh, we, we discussed quite a lot of uh, topics. We touched upon lots of topics. Uh, and, and under uh, guidance of Dr. Nene, uh, we could do, do all this. Um, as Sir rightly said, that if at all uh, any uh, burning questions, any topics, any uh, cases, if you want to uh, discuss it out, you you are always welcome to put it on the group. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Ortho TV here because uh, because uh, they supported this, and because of them only we could uh, reach out to you guys. Uh, and I all uh, thank Nene sir and all other uh, our faculty members also for their uh, all, means the usual support they have extended all throughout this fellowship program. So um, as sir said, uh, we can meet up during our ASICON course in Jan in Mumbai. So let's hope uh, we'll have some get together. Thanks guys and uh, be in touch through our WhatsApp chat group. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, notify as soon as we put up our uh, case videos on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Ajitya, sir? Ha, Tosif. Yeah, sir. Uh, only one topic uh, of the redo spine is left for most probably for the next week. Uh, Okay, so if uh, more than, I mean, majority of guys, if they feel that that has to be touched upon, then we can uh, notify that in a group. So we'll intimate you whether we are going ahead with that topic or not. So uh, let's take yes. a poll yeah. that uh, uh, means how many of you want this topic to be discussed. So depending on that, we can take a call and we can uh, notify on the group that we are going ahead with that topic then. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Chalo. Good night. Bye. Good night, sir. Bye. Bye. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.